For our next module, we're going to be looking at Module 6, which is entitled Functions. And our first lesson is going to be 6.1, Identifying and Representing Functions. And 6.1 is going to be broken apart into two separate lessons. And 6.1a, then, is going to be Identifying Functions from what are called Mapping Diagrams. And our goal for this lesson is to determine if a mapping diagram represents a function or not. Now, I'm sure that just in going over uh, the title of the lesson and title of the module and all that kind of stuff, there's some terminology that you're not quite familiar with, and that is completely understandable. Uh, we'll use this terminology quite a bit, though, so let's start off by taking a look at some terminology that will help us move through this lesson a little better. And I realize that I have graph paper in the background of my video, but um, I do not believe that you'll need graph paper for this lesson, so I apologize if you started on graph paper, but you will not need it for this lesson. Now, before we get into our vocabulary and that type of thing, I want to take us back to where we've been a little bit and connect it to where we're going. So for this first example, uh, it says you need to buy some new pencils, but you aren't sure of the cost. One friend says she bought two pencils for $1, while another said he bought six pencils for $3. What co rule could we use to describe the cost of a pencil? Now, as I'm sure you're reading through this, you can probably pretty quickly figure out in your head how much a single pencil can cost. And that's kind of the, the hope with this example, to, to start off with something that's a little bit easier and take us to, to where we want to be. Now, with the rule that we come up with, we wouldn't want to be able to figure out, all right, if I want to buy this, this many pencils, how much money will that cost? Or if I have this much money, how many pencils can I buy? We use rules like that to help us make smart choices when we're when we're trying to uh, make purchases or different things like that. So in this instance, what we're going to use for this situation, we're just going to say that the cost is going to be equal to 0.5p. So the cost that or the amount of money that we have to spend is 0.5 times p. 0.5 because each pencil we should be able to see cost 50 cents. So we take the number of pencils that we want to buy, multiply it by 0.5, and that gives us the cost of the pencils that we're purchasing. So if we want to figure out how much four pencils would cost, we can look at the information that we're given in the table, or given in the, in the statement right here, and probably pretty easily figure out that four pencils would cost $2. But if we wanted to figure out the cost of 20 pencils or 100 pencils, we're going to want to use a rule like this to help us out to make things a little bit easier. So on your own, a couple things that I want you to figure out for yourself. Let's say that you have wanted to buy 12 pencils. How much would that cost? Go ahead and take a moment. And then our other question is going to be, let's say that you had $20. How many pencils could you buy? So again, how much would 12 pencils cost? And the other question, if you had $20, how many pencils could you buy? Go ahead and pause the video, answer those two questions. All right, so if you had 12 pencils, you would substitute 12 in for P, giving us C is equal to 0.5 times 12. Now we do a little bit of multiplication. 0.5, or half of 12, is going to give us C is equal to 6. But what label are we using? It's going to be $6 for the 12 pencils. All right, so that was the first one that I wanted you to look at. Second one, I asked you how many pencils could you buy with $20. So again, rewriting our equation, C is equal to 0.5P. But if we had $20, we're going to substitute that in for the cost, giving us 20 is equal to 0.5 times P. And so now we would go ahead, divide both sides by 0.5. These would cancel, and we get P is equal to 20 divided by 0.5, if you need a calculator for that, fine. If you, know, if you don't need a calculator, even better. But that would give you 40. So you would be able to buy 40 pencils. All right, 40 pencils for $20. Now, we go over this to talk a little bit about relationships, mathematical relationships at least, and talk about how the relationships that we're dealing with here are typically going to also be called functions. Now this example one, this happens to be a linear relationship, but at the same time it is a function. 
Now the key thing that we need to understand about a function is that we have inputs leading to outputs. So the inputs are going to be the independent variable, the number of pencils that we want to buy. The outputs in this case is going to be the cost, the amount of money that we have to spend. Now the key thing to remember about a function, and I'll write this down for you in just a moment so that you can get the wording exactly right. The key thing that we need to understand about a function is that in a function, every single input has one output. So therefore, one input value cannot lead to two output values. That would be like saying that a person bought two pencils for a dollar, and then another person bought two pencils for three dollars that other person would not be happy about that, knowing that they bought the same number of pencils as another person, but they paid more money for theirs. So in a function, each input or each independent variable leads to only one output. Now that leads us to our definition of function. It's a relationship in which every input leads to only one output. However, what I want you guys to realize is that does not necessarily mean that one output can result from more than one input. Now, in my experience, helping kids understand this is kind of like helping you guys look at it as cause and effect. I know that you guys have spent time throughout your growing up years in school learning about cause and effect. We need to think of input as the cause and the output as the effect. So if we think of, if we think of tripping, as an input and if we think of someone pushing you as another input. Those can both lead to the same output which would be falling. So an input of tripping would be would have an output of a fall and someone pushing you as an input could also lead to the output of you as a fall. But if someone pushes you that does not going to that's not going to make you either fall or suddenly start to float away. Okay, that's not how it works. An input can only lead to one output. All right. So when it comes to actually using mapping diagrams to represent functions, this is what they're going to look like. They're actually going to look like uh, two ovals with the word input and output above them. Now hold off on drawing these because there's more to them than that. So again, two ovals with the word input and output above them. And then inside of each number are going to be a set of numbers and sometimes these set of numbers will have a pattern sometimes they won't have a pattern a function does not need to have a pattern in order to be a function it needs to have an input every input value going to one output value so if we put values in for our input and output for example for our input we could have one three and eight and for our output we could have two four and seven now that does not mean that the numbers do not necessarily have to match from the numbers across from each other. We're going to have arrows as well as part of our diagram to show which input maps to which output. So with these arrows, we show that the input value of 1 has an output value of 4, the input value of 3 has an output value of 7, and the input value of 8 has an output of 2. Now we don't know, and honestly we don't care, what type of scenario would exist that would cause these input values to lead to lead to those specific output values. So why 1, 3, and 8 would lead to 2, 4, and 7 with the arrows written as they do, we don't know, and honestly it's not important. We don't care about that. We just have to understand that we're looking at our inputs here, and we want to make sure that there is only one arrow coming from each input. Okay, We only want one arrow coming from each input. If we ever have an input that has two arrows coming from it going to two different output values, that makes that diagram not a function. And that's what we're keying in on. That's what we're looking for. We're trying to make sure that for our input values, each value that we have here, there is only one arrow coming from that value pointing to one output value. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at some additional examples of what a function is and what a function is not. For a second example, we have our mapping diagram with input values of 1, 3, 5, and 7 and output values of 2, 4, 6, and 8. So if we were asked to determine if this, this 
mapping diagram represents a function or not? For this one, we would say that it is. And the reason that it is, we look at each input value, and every single input only has one arrow being drawn from it to output values. Okay? So each input leads to only one output. That's what we're looking for. If you ever see a diagram where a single input value has two lines coming from it going to different output values, that's going to inform you that it's not a function. For this one, we would say yes, it's a function because every input pairs with only one output. All right, and I wrote down the answer that you should use. Again, yes, this is a function because every input pairs with only one output. Let's take a look at another one. For our next example, we have input values of 7, 11, 22, and 50. And for outputs, we have 5, 16, and 17. Now when we look at this more closely, we see that 7 leads to 16, 11 leads to 17, 22 also leads to 16, and 50 leads to 5. Now the, the question we have to ask ourselves here is 7 leads to 16 and 22 leads to 16. Is that okay? It, is this still a function despite the fact that we have two different inputs leading to one output? And for this one, yes, that is okay. It is still a function because even though we have two inputs mapping to one output, that's okay. We don't have any inputs that map to two different outputs. So we don't have any inputs that lead to two different output values, and that's what we need. So even though 7 and 22 both lead to 16, that's okay. It's still a function because, again, each input has only one output. For our last mapping diagram, we have input values of 3, 5, and 8, and output values of 1, 4, 9, and 16. And in this mapping diagram, we see that 3 leads to 9, 5 leads to 1, 8 leads to 4, and 8 leads to 16. So the question again is, does this mapping diagram represent a function? And our answer for this one is no, it does not. 3 leads to only one number, which is good. 5 also leads to only one number, which is also good. However, when we get to 8, we see that 8 maps to 4, and 8 also maps to 16. Because 8 maps to two different numbers, that makes this entire relationship not a function. Because of that one single input, the single input with a value of 8, mapping to two different outputs, just because of that one input value, that makes this not a function. So let me go ahead and type out our answer for this. So our answer for this again is not a function because the input value of 8 maps to two output values. All right, now I know that a lot's been thrown at you guys in this lesson with things that, such as uh, mapping diagrams and functions and um, a number mapping to another number, those different types of things. Um, so what I want you to write down your questions that you might have so that we can discuss them in class um, and move forward from there. There are two different types of ways of representing functions that we're going to take a look at in the upcoming lesson. But for today, I hope you feel confident that you can determine if a mapping diagram represents a function or not. Again, remember to write down your questions. We'll go over those in class.